truly my pleasure to be here with Rick, uh, chairman of Tupperware. Um, Rick, you have been in the business of empowering women your entire career, so we're delighted to have you here. Good to be here. So we wanted to start by just asking you, I think probably only very few people in this room don't know you, but uh, I thought it would be great for you to tell us a little bit about your career and your background and this business of empowering women that you've been in for the last 30 years or so. Um, I came up here in, uh, in my mid-30s and joined, joined Avon. It was, a, it was a great time. Uh, moved Im immediately to uh, Europe, ran Germany, Austria, then moved to Asia and was the group president over there and then moved back as president. It was, um, it was the first time I ever had a, uh, the opportunity where everybody who was there on the front line were women. And uh, it was, a, it was a, an incredible time because I saw the power of it firsthand. And I saw mostly outside the US that it was every bit as powerful and yet it hadn't been leveraged. And then uh, I got the call 25 years ago to go to Tupperware. Mm -hmm. uh, it needed revitalization. And I already knew what the key was, needed more women. Uh, in it, more women in leadership roles, and it's been a wonderful 25 years. <laughs> well, you have been uh, at the forefront of a lot of this work, um, and now diversity and inclusion, not just gender, but uh, diversity more generally as we're here at the Business of Equality Summit, is really top of mind for companies today. So I think more and more companies are recognizing what you've recognized for the last 30, 40 years. Um, and the research is now giving us the opportunity to really make the business case. I think Willis Towers Watson, in fact, just put out some research that shows that two-thirds of employers, two-thirds of companies, want to increase their activities to promote an inclusive environment. And so we have the research now. We have a better uh, handle on the business case. How have you used the business case in your organization and, and around the world as you've used you around Tupperware? Well, it's interesting. Um, just li like you, I've been going to Davos uh, many years, I think 15. Our uh, first time at Davos, um, I noticed there was not a single focus on women in the entire Congress hall, and I saw that continued for four or five more years. And I started then doing television interviews and complaining about it and talking to Chairman Klaus uh, about it, and I said, hey, it is really the subject that needs to be brought forward here around the world because our whole theme wa was improving the state of the world. I'm pleased to say uh, efforts with Milan, you, others, there were a dozen, dozen subjects last year really <laughs> on it. And I think one of the things we've really done is to, and I've really preached this, I, I, I get the whole thing about social justice. But when you talk about it's not fair, you make a victim of someone, and I want to leverage the power uh, of women. Not, it's not fair. And uh, the moment we started to sit there and talk more about it not being a barrier to be broken, but an opportunity to be leveraged, then people started paying more attention to it. And I think that was the beginning of it change the narrative of this. And when people start to say, well, if I don't do this, I'm not very smart. I said, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> well, we did see, actually, just to follow up on that, we saw a huge change really in the last five to seven years, I would say, um, and a very intentional um, effort on a lot of people to put out research, you know, valid research, of course. But I think when Bob Zellick from the World Bank said gender equality is smart economics about seven or eight years ago, and then Prime Minister Abe showed up at Davos to talk about women omics. We saw a landslide. We saw a real shift. But yet, here we are, <laughs> still talking about these issues. And while we're making progress, um, we have other challenges that we're facing. I think Julie brought up some of them. Um, some people are starting to feel that maybe they're being left behind in some way. Um, and you know, some people are seeing this as a zero-sum game. And so how do we shift that mindset? Well, I think the, the, there needs to be firstly a bifurcation of the narrative from the uh, emerging world versus the developed market world. Uh, and, and let me tell you what I mean by then, because it's not the same narrative. When you hear, you hear so much about glass ceilings. When you go to most of the world, it's about sticky floors. 
Yes, I mean, forget the ceiling. And uh, I mean, by the way, I, we focused on that. Half our board are women. My successor, now the CEO of the company, is, is a woman. So we've done all that. I agree with that. But you have to be able to also articulate a theme in other markets that people get and understand uh, and resonates with them. Let me, let me give you a classic example of it. Uh, uh, Indonesia is the fourth largest population in the world, quarter of a billion people. This is just one example of things you can do because there are levers. 85% Muslim, and by law, he is he is in charge of the family. It is a law. He's the boss of the family. So we knew it was a great market, 13,000 islands. We said, well, how do we then get everybody into this so it doesn't have, happen what you mentioned, Kim? So some people feel really, hey, all this focus on women, what about me? Uh, so I had all of our associates come together, and I had our distributors each bring their husbands to a two-hour session that I was going to do myself on a stage uh, with simultaneous Bahasa translation. And I knew to make it interesting, I had to make it entertaining. Uh, and it wasn't going to be, well, the way we'll make sure they understand is we'll educate them. Most people, uh, that's not the right word. <laughs> Almost everybody wants to be enlightened, though. So we did a whole session. And I started off with some things that were funny. Uh, the difference between men and women. Uh, and I wasn't preaching. I would show a woman's brain and a man's brain. And oh, they loved it. The man's brain is almost always larger. And they'd say, oh, great. <laughs> and then we showed the woman's brain. And then we showed that in, across the world, she scores 4% higher on tests around the world. So bigger, but not more efficient. And then, then we used to, then we'd go into funny things. Well, what does he do with that other pot, the, the other space in his brain? And there's some things I'm not going to repeat today. They had lots of fun. I mean, we would talk about the nothing box that sometimes, you can never talk to a woman and say, is there, what are you thinking about? She says, nothing. You actually can with a man, psychiatrist friend, because sometimes he's just thinking about nothing, OK? <laughs> So we went through that. We talked about things like, actually, technical matter. Corpus callosum, which is the Wi-Fi of the brain, which enables a woman to multitask. And it's how we were raised. He was the hunter. She had to do everything else. And so we would build off, off that thing. And in a couple hours, he started to say, gosh, she has gifts that I don't have, and if we put these things together, it's going to work. All I can tell you is, within two years, it became our number one market in the world, quarter of a billion people. So I believe enlightenment is, is one of the ways to do it, uh, and that's an example in an emerging market of the world. Well, I'm going to take us back to Davos, because I'd love to hear your thoughts on how we enlighten some of the folks at Davos. We know the joke at Davos is that the shortest line at <coughs> Davos is the ladies' room. That's actually not a joke. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, that is another place that needs enlightenment. And I think you've raised the issue that over the last several years, we've seen that happening. But you know, how, do you make it, uh, how do you make that same case, you know, showing that diversity pays um, in those corners of the world, um, where you know, there seems to be a lot of conversations happening, but maybe not as much action as we like to see. It's not accelerating as quickly as we'd like. Well, it, it, here's interesting, uh, and you're so spot on with that. We still have uh, less than 20% of the attendees at Davos uh, are, are women. And then so we came up with the, uh, uh, on the controlling council, okay, you have to have X percent women, or you can only have certain amount of badges. And you know, the whole thing is about 2,000 people. And so what you saw was a reduction in some of the badges because some of the companies just weren't going to get behind us. I very much believe in affirmative action kind of things early on, but that's just preliminary kinds of things. Uh, I, I think Davos is still very much uh, suffering and struggling mm -hmm. uh, with this. And we start to have more sessions, 
more people are complaining. It's not just me on the television stations, because I thought I'd never been invited back to Davos. I complain <laughs> uh, so much. But now, lots of sessions about it. So the worm is starting to, to turn, and more people are talking about the economic case and not the social justice case. Uh, but however, the last study, you've seen it like I have, they believe at the current rate of progress, we will achieve equality and gender parity in 88 years. I, I'd like to be around. I don't think I'm going to make that. <laughs> but, it's a, so you, but that doesn't mean you do this, what we're doing here today. You keep chipping away of it. You get more advocates uh, on it, and you, get, and you spread the word. I do think that we're seeing some acceleration happening in large part because of technology, and maybe we'll talk about it in a few minutes. But one of the things that was really interesting, when we were looking at some of the statistics around the 20% leadership stat, that happens everywhere in the world. I think anywhere you look in the world, there's generally 20% women leaders. It doesn't matter if it's a government, company. It's usually around 20%. It's been uh, inching up a bit. But we were talking to Gina Davis about that, and she says, well, that's interesting. In, in films, the extras on films are generally 17% women. And I thought, wow, maybe we're just conditioned to see this 20% as kind of equal and normal. Um, so I would really appreciate it last night uh, here and, and the work that, that everyone's doing around advertising um, and to really drive media participation of women. And uh, last night, Mark Pritchard of P&G gave a really uh, inspiring conversation about you know, power that advertising can have in changing mindsets. Because this is about changing mindsets, right? It really is. That's, yeah. But yet we see now that there's some, uh, with Me Too and Time's Up, we've seen kind of this, this issue hitting mass culture and it's becoming kind of mainstream. But we're also seeing a little backlash, right? We're seeing some backlash in some corners and we're seeing some men um, feeling that, you know, I'm not gonna mentor a woman, I'm sorry, I just can't risk it. I'm not taking a woman out to lunch, I just can't risk it. So there's, some men might be slightly overcorrecting. What can we do about that? Well, you and I talked about that last week. Uh, I, I've gotta say, um, uh, I've prided myself uh, in the women who have come forward in the organization who, who have mentored, and to mentor them, you've got to spend time with them. Uh, you absolutely have to spend time with this. I, I, um, I was thrilled for, uh, for 30 years I was involved in Boys and Girls Clubs of America, and as a matter of fact, led the effort, we changed the name, get this, from Boys Clubs uh, to Boys and Girls Clubs, because 30% of the members were girls, and he would bring his little sister. But then we started to have to have, you know, come up with programs to support her, smart girls programs, give her education, et cetera. So I saw early on the need that you've got to provide sponsorship and mentorship. Uh, we've talked about that incredible Bain study that showed if you take people coming in and really college educated high flyers uh, and ask them about uh, their belief and confidence in making it to a C-suite. It's about the same for men and women, and yet when you circle back over to their now mid-career, at least 50% drop in her confidence. And part of that gets to be the sponsorship and the mentoring. She usually has to go it alone. Mm -hmm. And when I say go it alone, boy, from us holding women's conferences within our company, we see that women have got to dial it up with regard to helping other women uh, uh, make it up, Whereas, and where there was actually competition. Uh, and 60% of all women would rather work for a man. Hmm, why is that? I think the worm's turning, starting to, to turn. But there's this, it's a difficult environment right, right now, particularly with this Me Too movement. It's interesting, so many women get uh, I, I call it the R jobs, IR, PR, uh, uh, and HR. <laughs> and often and they get, and they get, they get, by the way, my successor, she came out of HR. <coughs> Two master's degrees because what, what better resource have we got than our people? Everything else can change, products, how, channels of distribution, but he who can, and by he I mean she too, can <laughs> recruit, uh, empower, reward, and retain, they're gonna win. So what I found ways was, how do you take people who are in those jobs and give them added responsibility? 
what, what we tried to do, the, uh, the IR people would always travel with me. We're a public company. And it's interesting, every single one of my IR people, probably 75% have been women, but guys too, every one of them got promoted. Because, not because they knew me, but they got exposure. They, they've got mentoring. They got sponsorship. And, uh, and then they get lifted in the organization. So uh, it, it, it's harder now, this overreaction. But you've got to go to it. You've got to go to lunch and you've got to go to dinner with great people. Yeah. You've got to spend time with them. The hell with what it looks like. <laughs> agreed. 100% agreed. So do you think, I, I Julie mentioned this earlier, do you think language is holding us back in some way? I mean, people are maybe over-responding to certain words. I know there was some uh, research around the idea that even the word diversity, maybe we need to have a new lexicon. And we've been talking a lot about, we talk a lot about the inclusive economy. Do you think language is holding us back? I think a preconception of what a word like diversity means, it's usually linked to the historical patterns in our mind, and it is usually social justice. Mm -hmm. And you start to reprogram the mind to understand that if you have great diversity, whether this is uh, you know, all aspects, I mean, this is race, sexual uh, orientation, you, you get into this, the more you find great diversity in an organization, I think you, you, uh, the facts show it. You increase, firstly, creativity. People come there and uh, they feel safe uh, in, in an envi environment to express themselves. You, you get heightened retention in an organization because they say, this isn't just some job. This is part of this thing we, we, we do. Uh, in our, and then you get heightened engagement in an or, organization. So I think there's the challenge. How do, we, how do we change the meaning of what diversity really the payoff is mm -hmm. rather than it's not a thing we have to do. It's a thing that we should want to get to. Well, it's so interesting, the generational shift that oh, we're seeing. Thank God for millennials. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, in our research for our book, we found that 80% uh, of women didn't, wanted to have purpose in their work in some way or another. 60% of millennials wouldn't even go to work, men or women, unless they felt that their work had some meaning. And so I think when, when I give talks on this topic, and we just did one, I, I teach at Cornell, uh, a class at Cornell, and I gave this whole talk about the business case. And inevitably, in every class that I teach this, a millennial will raise their, or younger, will raise their hand and say, I understand why you're using the business case, but what about social justice? Isn't this just the right thing to do? Why are we talking about the business case? So I think this next generation coming up just ex doesn't expect what they're about to <laughs> encounter, A, but B, envisions a world that's very different than the one that we've kind of been living in. And so there's going to be some sort of shift, but I think we need to figure out what that language is to quickly uh, bridge that gap. I've never had anybody ask that question with regard to the language of it, but I think you're onto something there. Because I kind of, I don't like using the term a business case, mm -hmm. because part of it ought to be as humans, right. <laughs> as spiritual beings. This is how we are. So I get that millennial right. attitude about it. Of why do you have to say business case? Well, because most people have had the social justice jammed down as they have to do it. Well, I mean, as a direct selling leader, I guess this is all about playing to your audience, right? Like you got to know your audience yeah. and what they can. But actually, Julian, as I said, Willis Towers Watson has really been focused a little bit on this language issue. And I think they're onto something there. I think that's a really important piece of it. On the spiritual front, I mean, this idea of changing mindsets and changing, changing hearts is really what we're talking about. How do we live in a more human, humanitarian environment? I mean, I think people want that at work now, too, just as much as they want it in their, in their regular lives. There was one woman um, that I really admire from mid-20th century in Iran who was blind. She lived in a rural village in Iran and, um, you know, was very patriarchal. And... Uh, she had this saying that if you change a person's mindset, their actions would follow. And so she went around to educate not just the men, but the men and the women on the role of, of men and women and girls and boys. And I, I feel like people like you who have modeled for us what good leadership looks like um, is making a big difference in all this. So we thank you for that. Yeah. So 
Uh, to build this inclusive culture, as you know, uh, we think technology is pretty key to that. And I think you know that we, we Milan and I, and, and Sharon Bowen, have started something called Seneca Connect, which is a technology product uh, to create inclusive environments at work. And a lot of that is, again, showing leaders and sharing tips and tactics, because everybody in this room has amazing tips and tactics to share on, on how do you shift a culture. Um, it's not just academic, right? These are practical things. Is there something that you want to leave the audience with, a call to action that you would ask people in this room to, to take with them, an insight that you could share from your career? Yeah, I, I would start out with, for the, with the thought, let's not us forget and look at everything through either European or American eyes. Uh, we're 4.5 percent of the world's population. Europe is about the same. We're not the rest of the world. There's a wonderful new book out you ought to get. It's called um, Visualizing Change. And it actually, what it does is it takes facts and plots them out around the world. And you start to see, uh-oh, where is the future heading? Uh, and I, I, I have to say again, start to understand that we're not the, you know, we are not the world. We are, we are part of the world. Very interesting, as critical as you hear this administration be about China. When I lived in Hong Kong, 66% of Chinese, 66% lived in what's called extreme poverty. Do you know what that percentage is today? 1.6 percent. It is working, a combination of their economic model, and yes, there were bad years on their political model, but something is working right there when in fact people are, they come here, get educated, get their PhD, where do they go? Back there now. So that's one thing that I would, you know, I keep on my phone too, this, um, I get all this STEM stuff. But let me tell you the, the, uh, the fact on, on STEM. Uh, there's not going to be enough jobs to go around. And, and most people, again, live elsewhere, not here. Two-thirds of the world's population are over 20 years old. They're not going back to college. And so I'm sitting there saying, oh, 88 years before you know, gender equality. I say, what do we do now with it? And I say, what if we could leverage skills people have right now? I actually, can you see me, do I keep this on my phone? It is. Uh, Are you downloading Senate Connect app no. right now? <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's where, that's why you're starting to hit some of the, those things again. Okay. Qualities not measured by cognitive tests. Okay. And what I'm going to say to you on this is, I read these, and then I sit there, and I, and I think of women with sixth grade educations in Malaysia, or the Philippines, or in Africa. Uh, and we've got 3.2 million, and I see them all of a sudden, they build big businesses. And I said, well, wait, she doesn't have any education. And I read, hmm, cognitive, well, they miss this. Self-discipline, persistence, courage, resilience, enthusiasm, reliability, empathy, civic mindedness, <laughs> curiosity, endurance, resourcefulness. That's, they're out there right now. That's why I love new business platforms. I don't like Uber so much with some of their issues, but I use them a lot. I had a woman pick me up named Louise, because I interviewed her while she was, I mean, and I said, Louise, what would you do education-wise? Sixth grade education? She was probably 60 years old. Little girl sitting in, her, in the front seat. Not a new SUV, but probably three or four years old. She took to dinner. Uh, I was meeting a friend, uh, mentoring actually. Uh, and she said, I'll pick you up after. This was in Orlando. She picked me up after it. And I continued to interview her. I said, What'd you have, what were you doing before? She said, I cleaned houses. I said, hmm, are you making more? She said, double. Uh, and I said, what'd you have to learn? She said, well, I knew how to drive. Honey, she said, I was driving when I was 14. I said, okay. Did you know locally? Yeah, I knew it, like the back of my hand. What'd you have to learn? She said, really, nothing. I liked people. 
And uh, I started to say, wow, mm. that's why she was great. By the way, you know what I found out? Because the little girl wasn't there. The little girl was <coughs> a homeless girl she'd been raising for three years. And I sit there and say, geez, find more platforms for women around the world because she may not have STEM skills, but who cares? She has all these incredible qualities. So that's what I want to start to see happening. And that's from a humanist stand standpoint around the world. Forgive the long description, but I hope it, it comes across. I keep thinking of Louise. Well, we have to thank you. We're, we're sorry to have to end this conversation. As you can imagine, we all want to hang out with Rick all day. Um, <laughs> But uh, I want to thank Willis Towers Watson for hosting this breakfast for us. And now we'll invite you all to join us on the seventh floor to continue the program. Thank you so much, Rick, for being here. Good to be here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.